Good morning, everyone. Good morning to all you here, and good morning to all of you joining us on the live webcast. Wherever you may be around the world, we just want to welcome you to Sabbath Worship Services here from Spanish Fort, Alabama. We hope that you're having a wonderful day. We're just being, we're blessed here with such beautiful weather today, and we hope that y'all are having it as well. It is wonderful that we can all worship together our Creator today. So if you will please join me in the opening prayer, we will get service started. Great eternal living God, Creator of all things, Father God, we, we come before you. It's a commanded assembly today, but we're here. We love you, Father, and we love our High Priest, our King, Jesus Christ, who has come before us and is our perfect example, Father. And we're here today to prepare and, and learn and so that we can be useful to our, uh, our King when he returns to here to earth to bring in uh, a new, uh, your way of life, Father, a right way of life, a way that will bring prosperity and harmony to this earth. So, Father, we ask that you bless these uh, services, bless the hearing and the speaking, and bless the webcast. Let help the transmission to be successful. And we ask, please, please keep our adversary away. Protect this place here, Father, where we worship and worship you before you and also protect all those around the world as they gather today on this day to to worship you as well father we ask that you be with those who are unable to attend and be watchful over them help help them with their health and whatever infirmities or afflictions they may have father so we ask that you be with them so we we give you praise glory honor and thank you father for all this and your son's holy and righteous and precious name amen well, brethren, if you will please rise, if you're able to, we will worship and praise our Creator through song. The first song is titled Sabbath Song, number 50. Sabbath Song, page 50. Very good, brethren. Let's move on to our next song, our next opportunity to praise and worship our Creator. The title is, It is Good to Sing Thy Praises, page 51. It is Good to Sing Thy Praises, number 51.
very, very good, brethren. Please be seated. And now our announcements will be brought to us by our pastor, Scott Hopper. Well, good morning to everybody and uh, welcome. Good morning. Good morning, boy. I want so badly to bring Nada up here and let everybody see her hat, but I don't want to embarrass her forever. But I don't know. I, don't, I, I know her pretty well, but I don't know her that well, so maybe it wouldn't. You want to come up so everybody can see? You, you got it. This lady is the hat lady. And this is Nada, Bruce, our song director. This is his wife. Look at that. That she just oh, thank you. I you won't she thankfully she didn't crow or anything, but um I I told her when she came in she looked like uh uh really they have these what's the name of those chickens that are so fancy? We had some folks in Florida we knew that had three of them in their house as pets. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think they still do, but anyway. Let's go over to uh, Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 1 as we continue to uh, take some time during the announcements to just read from the Word of God. And I'll make a few comments. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 1. Hear you children. Now, as we read this, this can apply to physical children, obviously, but it also applies to you and me as children. Um, the instruction of a father, we can say our father as well, and attend to no understanding. For I give you good doctrine, forsake you not my law. For I was my father's son, tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. He taught me also and said unto me, let your heart retain my words, keep my commandments and live. This world is quickly spiraling more and more to, uh, yeah, to have no understanding of all kinds of things. It's amazing. The technology is incredible. But to keep God's commandments and live, even as a servant of God, I can tell you this, things have really changed when if you really want to get in trouble within the body of Christ, all you have to do is suggest a course correction or change for someone. I don't care how careful you are. And they get offended, or they get mad, or they get angry, or they have a rebuttal or an explanation. You know, they'll say, well, what do we do? We're having all these things go on. We don't know what to do. I'm like, well, have you considered this? And the claws come out. So if I say keep God's commandments and live doesn't mean you're going to have a perfect life with no problems, no challenges, no pain, no suffering. Get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not, neither decline from the words of my mouth. Forsake her not, and she shall preserve you. Love her, and she shall keep you. Wisdom is the principal thing, and like I've mentioned before, godly wisdom is very different than worldly wisdom. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all you're getting, get understanding. That's why I encourage folks to spend the time with God first, and all the other stuff will come in play. Yeah, but I got, I got my job, I got my family, I got to mow the grass, wash the car, I got to sleep. Yeah, you're right. But you put all those things ahead of God, I tell you what's going to happen. Someday he's going to say, um, how you doing? We're going to talk about that during the message, sermon message today. To get wisdom and get understanding. That's why I encourage folks to connect to the midweek Bible study on Tuesday night, which is the middle of the week, as I've explained. No, Wednesday's hump day. No, that's not the middle of the week. And I've explained that so many times. But the Sabbath and Sunday's the first day of the week. So if you count it, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday... Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then you're back to the Sabbath. So you're right in the middle of the week. Try shifting and making. I did this in, in owning companies. I did this for decades. Sunday was the first day of the week for me. Employees and that, yeah, Monday through Friday. But it wasn't, oh, thankfully the weekend's here. It's not the weekend. It's the Sabbath. And then the first day of the week. Just saying. For those of you that, Bruce, we were talking about being specific and technical. 
But that's not what the world teaches, is it? I just wiped this mic up. But. Exalt her, she shall promote you. Talking about wisdom, she shall bring you to honor when you do embrace her. She shall give your head an ornament of grace. A crown of the glory shall she deliver to you. See, Nada, we are talking about your hat. Hear, O my son, and receive my sayings. Again, this could apply to all of us. And the years of your life shall be many. I will tell you this. If you seek God first and his wisdom and his understanding and his truth and remember his commandments and keep them in your heart, you may not physically live a little bit longer, but you'll be happier. You will. In a world that says, oh, that's ridiculous. Solomon, remember, we went through the Ecclesiastes. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die. That's the total sum. No, what, do you, what else did he say, remember? Fear God and do his will. It's all that matters and never will. So we run around like chickens with our head cut off. We got all these deadlines, all these things we have to do. We all do. I'm just like you. I have the same thing. I have choices to make every day. You have to consciously say, this is what I'm going to do. And then if you like to gamble, take your shot. Do whatever you want to do. This time of year before Passover, uh, it's always this way. Folks call and say, oh, this is this is not working, that's not working, this is bad, that's bad. I'm like, so, okay, uh, what do we do? Human beings are a weird lot. We seek God with all our heart when everything goes south and doesn't go right. When everything's great, we got plenty of money, our health, energy, all the stuff we have, we don't have time for God. Hear, O my son, receive my sayings, and the years of your life shall be many. I have taught you in the way of wisdom. I have led you in right paths. When you go, your step shall, shall not be straightened. And when you run, you shall not stumble. I can relate to that. I know Gail can. I don't run anymore. I ride my bike for exercise because I can't stand very long. Can't, can't run. Haven't been able to run for years, but can't walk very far. But I don't like to stumble. You don't either, do you? Then stop it, Danny. <laughs> Take fast hold of instruction. Do not let her go. Keep her, for she is your life. The instruction of God's word, don't let it go. This is coming before Passover. It's time to examine, say, where are we? We're going to talk about that too, but Consciously make a decision. Say, I don't care about, you know. My wife has a famous saying, because I love to keep the grass cut when it grows. And she said, I said, oh, I don't want to cut the grass. I'd rather do this, or I've got this to prepare, and this time of year she'll say the grass can wait. You know, if you don't cut the grass, the world goes on. If you don't draw close to God in prayer, and study his word and instruction, the world doesn't go on. Not for you. Enter, enter, uh, enter not into the path of the wicked, and do not go into the way of evil men. Avoid it. Pass not by it. Turn from it and pass away. For they don't sleep except they have done mischief, and their sleep is taken away unless they cause some to fall. For they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. But the path of the just is the shining light that shines more and more into a perfect day. The way of the wicked is as darkness. They know not as what they stumble. I just have to laugh as we go through a political thing right now. I, I just, it's so, if not ha-ha making fun of them, it's just like seriously, folks. You know, I don't have a degree in political science, but I can tell you some of these things are not rocket science. And the answers, this is not a personal agenda or attack here, but I saw someone on The View that said the eclipse was due to climate change. <laughs> yeah, and you know how many people believe that? Now there's this big argument going back and forth because the other co-host said, you can't say that, it's not related at all. Boy, and now you got... You know, we'll probably have a special meeting over in Geneva about this. I'm sorry. I just, and then I saw this, somebody else said, you know, 
those chemtrails type things. It's what it is, is the burning of fuel. You were in the military, the diesel fuel that in the last few years, this they changed it to work. The same fuel that goes in, in the planes goes in the uh, big trucks they have, transport vehicles. They use this, and it, so it kicks out more stuff in the air. But you have people that are like, oh, that's from cows. <laughs> I, I grew up with cattle, cows, bulls, Jesus. sheep, lambs. You know, I can tell you the answer. If, if they really wanted to have a legitimate complaint, they could say, well, it's the rhinos and the elephants, because they do flatulate incredibly amount. Because they eat mostly hay and, you know, grass and whatever else they eat. But, you know, I don't know. I just, I laugh because it's like they don't know what they're stumbling at. My son, attend to my words, incline your ear into my sayings. Let them not depart. I'm going to just finish the chapter. Let them not depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. What's it mean not to, from, right in front of your eyes? Right? Have you ever had that? Someone said, "How I, I do this when I go to the refrigerator. It's a man thing. Where's the ketchup? It's right in front of you. No, it's not. So my wife comes in. It's right there. Wow, it's right in front of my eyes. Maybe I'm the only man that does that. I think it's a male thing. We just get, I don't know. I don't dare say there's nothing to eat because then I'll get a good answer on that from a bunch of people. Um, my son, verse 21, let them not depart from your eyes, keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh. Keep your heart. Interesting, with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. The Sancino commentary says, keep your mind from straying left or right, from the laws that I've taught you. That's a Jewish commentary. Uh, it's, I, I like using it. Put away from there a forward mouth. Okay, we all know what that is. A perverseness of lips. And perverse lips put far from you. Let not your eyes look right on. Let your eyelids look straight and before you. Ponder the path of your feet. And let all the ways, your ways, be established. I wrote in my Bible, you probably can't see it, but I wrote across that verse, think. You know? Think before you say something or do something or post something on social media. I realize that half of what I say people aren't listening to because when I say stay out of politics, they just stay right in it. They got to keep posting. Their Trump's their guy, and the president's the bad guy, and all that Democrats and all this stuff. Stay out of that. Turn not to the right hand to the left. Remove your foot from evil. Your entire being. If I put my foot here, the body kind of follows. You notice that when you walk, you walk. Your feet start. I don't have my wireless mic on, so I got to stay close to that. But when you step, your body follows. Generally, except for when it doesn't, right, Danny? When you step and then your body flops. So most of the time, that's how we're supposed to be. So uh, Gail and Bruce remind me that we start in Chapter 5 next time. And uh, I decided to go through the whole chapter. I don't know why, I just did. Got a captive audience. Okay, um, announcements. The... Uh, Next week's Sabbath service will be held from here in Spanish Fort. We're down today, a few people, but that's fine. Uh, some are traveling. But next week, uh, Eric Myers will uh, be giving you a, a message uh, from Murfreesboro, Tennessee. So Eric Myers is scheduled and said he'd take, be glad to do that. The April and May schedules are up on the uh, website. Uh, and again, if you don't have internet, would like a hard copy. Let me know. We can mail that to you during the the original uh, Pony Express 
from back in whatever year that was, because I think it was faster then than it is now. Uh, just lots, everything's starting to s slow down some, but except for people wanting money or ideas on how to take your money. Um, the book of James, we're almost done. Uh, I think we might get done this time. The first 13 parts of it are now on the internet, on the website, under uh, fellowship opportunities. And you go underneath and it says Bible Basics. It'll have those so you can listen to those recordings. I went ahead on each one and broke down and said James chapter 5 verses 1 to 3 or whatever on each. So you can look at specific segment if you miss that. Uh, if you're unable to attend in person or, or on the Zoom web conference. Uh, and then I just uh, wanted to add the Bible Basics. We'll have it this Tuesday. Then the following Tuesday we won't because that's the week of Unleavened Bread. There's too much going on. Uh, and then the week of the, the April 30th would be. So we'll have it this week, the 16th. And then on the 30th, I'm beginning a new series and I changed my mind. Some of you got that email, I hope. And so uh, I am going to, uh, like I said, I've taught at Ambassador Bible, Co uh, Bible Center College, whatever they called it, uh, changed it, I think. But um, And uh, also uh, years ago in Pasadena at another college. Uh, and so I've uh, been thinking about and going back through, and I said, you know, it's been almost 40 years since I've given anything on the minor prophets, or as I call them, the not so minor prophets. So starting the 30th, uh, it'll be 35 to 40 sessions. So it'd be just like if you were taking a class. Uh, I, I probably bit off a lot, but uh, I just felt with the other asking folks to do some homework ahead of time was going to be just putting them over the edge. Um, shouldn't be that way, but it is. So we'll have that. We'll start with the minor prophets. If you don't know what the minor prophets are, all the more reason to, to connect with that. Uh, and we'll go through it verse by verse. And I'm not going to, I've got scheduled so many verses or how many, so many books for so many sessions, but I'll need to flex with that like we've done with the book of James. So I encourage you to connect with that. It's so easy to say, oh, I've had a long day. I'm just tired. But folks, uh, if I told you, and this is, I don't know, so don't read into this. If I told you Christ was coming back in one year, you guys would all be connected. I guarantee it. And we'd have, this place would be full again. I know. Been there, done that. Back in 1995, remember that? Our house was packed week after week because they thought we were going to lose everything we believed. And then time went on, and now we're back to. So uh, a week from tomorrow, Sunday night, will be the Passover, April 21st at 7.15. Uh, and I encourage you, if you can, to come by at, by at least 7. Please don't shift in at 25 after because um, we will have already begun. But uh, you can just, you know, read your Bible, whatever. But uh, bring your own towel. We'll provide the basins, right? We have plenty. I uh, was transferred one time and took over several congregations, seven of them actually, in the Carolinas. And this lady called from South Carolina. And she said, well, back when this and this happened, my whole garage, I would love to park my car, but it's full of stuff from the church. And I've never seen so much sound system stuff, but in there was like, I don't know, 80 foot basins and trays for the Passover service with the little wine decanters and our little thing, cups. And I did never forget that. I said, well, you know, we can use 20 of those. And we can use this, but take the rest of Goodwill. Boy, they were happy, donated. TV Back then we used TVs uh, and carts and TV carts and duplicating machines, and I just never, I said, I can't, I don't want to store all this. I still have chairs in storage from the uh, feast site in the Wisconsin Dells when that was sold. And I bought them. Okay, I bought them. I didn't take them. Someone said, oh, you stole these, did you? No, I bought them. 
whatever it was per chair, two bucks a chair. There were only like 20,000 chairs, so I did not buy 20,000. But we use those, okay? We use those at times when we have an overflow and everything's full. So um, I don't know why I told you that. It doesn't matter. But I, I just get, people get weird sometimes. The night to be observed will be the following night. I want to talk about this for a minute. The night to be observed, I had someone tell me, I'm not coming. I won't be part, I'm not going on that night. There's too much going on with Passover in the first day. And it's, it's not commanded in the Bible. And what it says is, it's a night to be observed throughout your generations to be remembered. Hence, some call it might be remembered. But it doesn't say you have to congregate and all have a meal on that night, specifically. That's a tradition. It doesn't say if you don't do this. So it's, it's the beginning, it's the holy day as it begins for the first day of unleavened bread. But there's nothing wrong with every tradition that the church or the body of Christ does. So uh, the Passover and the Holy Days are different, but I've done this now for almost 63 years of just getting together and having a meal and talking about hopefully we can change the conversation from my pains, my work, my whatever we talk about, and focus on what happened on that night and why we are free from Egypt as well, spiritual Egypt and the blessing of being called out of that. So that's a night to be much observed. It is not a commanded assembly uh, that I read. Am I? Do you see that? Anybody? But I think it's edifying. I think it's encouraging. I think it's great. But if you know, if you have a two-hour drive one way. And you don't want to drive uh, somewhere, I understand. Um, but that's the same also for the Passover and the Holy Day. You can also do that via webcast, do that at home. Uh, I know that's a different teaching than some of the little bit larger, they're not that much larger fellowships, that you must all be together where the pastor is as one group, otherwise it's not proper. Okay, that's a tradition taught as doctrine the last first day of unleavened bread will be april 23rd tuesday the last day will be monday april 29th uh same time same channel 10 15 we've been at 10 15 now for since 2018 except for when we have it which is when we travel like when i went to church of god big sandy i I'm not going to say, you have to change the time of services to facilitate my schedule. Of course not. That was in the afternoon at 2 and 3. But uh, for for webcasting and connecting and in person here in Spanish Fort, for now, it's at 10.15. Uh, if I did it for me, because I was up at 4.30 this morning, if I do it to fit my schedule, I'd have church at 8 o'clock. Boom. Then we'd have the rest of the day. To, but that would not go over so well with some of you. A uh, little bit later risers, which I, I respect. I don't like to get up that early, but, well, I shouldn't say I don't like to. Actually, this morning was beautiful when I had my coffee before all the traffic and, and lawnmowers and blowers and stuff going on, and the sun came up. Just beautiful. And I, th I reminded God how thankful I am for that sun that's creating the horrible climate change. Okay, so, pardon my sarcasm. All right, I want to clarify too. Sorry this has taken so long. Uh, no, I'm not sorry, but I, I don't like to have to go this long. There's an announcement in the bulletin, and I made the comment that we do not have as part of our worship services an official collection of an offering. I did not say that I do not believe you should take an offering or give an offering on the holy days. Actually, it's not every holy day. It's three seasons. Anybody need me to explain that again? Unleavened bread? Okay. Anybody know the second one? The Feast of Weeks or Pentecost. And what's the last one? The Feast of Tabernacles, the end gathering, Feast of end gathering. Three seasons, three times. So, I do not teach that you have to take an offering every holy day because it's not scriptural. And I remember the white-haired gentleman that made that decision. 
And he said that was so more money would come in to the work. God owns everything. I trust him. I don't need to twist your arm. So we still, yes, you can, there's an offering box in the hall here that you can put tithes or offerings in. You can mail it in. And you can also throughout the year send something in. But I have not taught that we don't, that I don't believe that we are to have to give an offering. Well, I don't teach that you don't have to tithe either. But why is that important? Because that's what someone, a couple people actually mentioned. They were concerned about me because of that and, and this ministry. Um, why don't we take it up during the worship services? Okay, I hope everybody listen carefully. If you're taking a snooze, wake up! I was going to tell my joke, but I already told it to this group, so they won't laugh. But, and I'd probably get in trouble. Somebody think I believe we're going to heaven or hell if I did that, so. But anyway, who was famous for collection of offerings and making a big to-do about how much they put in? Anybody remember? The Pharisees. I give tithes and offerings of all I possess. I fast twice in the week. Pat myself on the back, right? Them, themselves. Here's the problem. We have done this for decades. And I really don't care what people think when it comes to that because I want to do what Scripture says. Have you ever sat when they're passing, the guy's given the offering thing and it's always about the work and your heart and the work and if your heart's not in the work and you see people pulling their checkbooks out and, oh, you know, sweaty, writing down, oh, i got to do their offering because they haven't thought about it. Oh, i got to give. And then they pass the plate and... and I'll never forget this. One time when they passed the plate, I took it and handed it. My wife took it and handed it to the kids, and down it went. We didn't put anything in it. Oh, come here. We want to talk to you right after church. Two of the well-meaning intended deacons. We noticed that you didn't give an offering today. I wanted to say, mind your own business, but I didn't. What I said was, you know, I did. Well, we didn't see you put anything in. And I said, I do it online. Oh, can you do that? <laughs> but there's the problem. You feel guilty. And the guy gets up there. And remember in the day when they'd say, well, in Hawaii and Alaska, they give it so much per person. You know, dig into those pockets. And he'd do this. Come on. That's, you know, that's not godly. And it takes away from the service of the holy day. So I just decided I don't see that done. I know why it's done. And that's why we don't have it collect. We don't say you have to give an offering. Offerings are free will. It's between you and God. Tithing is different. Did you know that? Tithing is what? God says, if you make this, I own everything. And there's scriptures after scripture. Yet there are some that teach, oh, that's the old covenant. That, that's all done away. Blah, blah, blah. All right. Okay. That's, again, between you and God. Everything you do is between you and him. But I do not teach that we don't, the CGM, Church of God Ministries, or I personally believe you don't have to give an offering three seasons or three times a year. So, and there, I hope that was clear. Um, I don't mind being accused of stuff that I just am stupid and don't think and lack wisdom and is converted as a rock, which I can be. But when I don't do something, when it comes to that, and that's pretty substantial, tithing and offerings are, that's from God himself. All right, the Feast of Tabernacles, if you haven't registered, please do that. Uh, I realize this year is going to be fun. Uh, I had a widow lady call and said, I'm going to need rides back and forth. I don't know if she's on today, but I'm going to need rides back and forth to church for the feast. And I thought, hmm, okay, i got to figure out how to get that one done. Uh, so uh, we got a lot going on and uh, hoping that registration will continue. 
All right, uh, just a couple prayer requests. Um, got an update from Lord Jacoby. I contacted her and asked for one, so she gave an update. That's on the website under prayer requests. It also came out in the announcements if, if you want to look at that. Uh, then Dave Sharp, Dave Davis, uh, and then some ongoing. Oh, that's John Thompson. Uh, called yesterday. Must have been on your cell phone. Okay. I didn't show up on the caller ID in the office, but John Thompson from Montgomery. You remember uh, the uh, rare uh, called a nevus, uh, possible cancer spot in his right eye. Also called an eye freckle by some. Uh, can be at birth or develop later while well, they had concerns. So they did some kind of surgery. And yesterday that apparently went fine, and then they put some kind of radioactive uh, patch on his eye for four days. Um, don't know the details of that, but he said he's doing all things considered well uh, so far. Thank you for your prayers, and please continue that. So uh, John Thompson's uh, one of uh, God's children from up in Montgomery. All right, Bruce, I didn't forget you. So... Let's go ahead, and Bruce is going to lead a couple more songs, uh, and uh, we already showed not his hat, so we're good with that. Denny's still awake. Gail's still smiling. We're good. So after that, I'll be back up for the message. Well, brethren, if you... Well, please rise if you're able to and join me in praising and worshiping our Creator through song. We will sing. The first song is titled, O oh, Sing a New Song to the Lord, page 55. O oh, Sing a New Song to the Lord, number 55. good brethren let's move on to our last song our last opportunity to sing to our creator the title is oh my soul bless god the father number 61 
O oh, my soul, bless God the Father, page 61. brethren please be seated and, and now today's message will be brought to us by our pastor Scott Hopker wanted to uh, mention saludos a todos en Guatemala no hay y otros bienvenidos and also want to mention to Crispin Agwell and uh, the group there in East Africa. Welcome to you as well. And then uh, Eileen and Larry and Lorna and Harry. And hey, that rhymed. <laughs> Larry and Harry. Yeah, Larry, Harry, and Gary. There, there's no Gary, but I don't know. All right. We will be observing uh, the Passover service eight days from today on the evening of April 21st. And throughout the course of you, your rather, and my Christian life, um, we're going to find probably that some Passovers are more memorable and meaningful personally than others. Um, for years we've always said, oh, this was the best feast ever, talking about the Feast of Tabernacles to many. And I've sometimes said, well, this really wasn't the best one I had back in that place in that year. Sometimes it's a good feast. Sometimes it is really, but, you know, it becomes almost like a cliche. But is the Passover, some are more memorable and meaningful than others. If you've had a few years in the body of Christ or the church, you can probably see that already. But in part, at least this is often due of it being more memorable or more meaningful to the quality and the quantity of time and effort you've spent in time in preparation. Mentally focusing, reflection, self-examination. I didn't say beating yourself up, but just examining, looking at yourself, meditation, and study. So let's consider a question, if you will. Here's a question. How is your and my personal preparation coming this year? You may have said, well, I really haven't done anything, so you got eight days. How is your and my personal preparation coming? 
with just a few short days before the Days of Unleavened Bread, most are, and I'm going to make a comment on this too, which is I'm getting bolder, but that's okay. They're well underway or finished with the deleavening process. I would like you to ask yourself a question. Do you spend hundreds and hundreds of hours or all types of just laborious work getting rid of all the crumbs in your house prior to the Days of Unleavened Bread? I don't. Uh-oh. Shock. You want to know why? Because what does it say in Scripture? Here we go. What does it say in Scripture? Anybody? It says what to do as far as leavening? Does this say to go through and find every little crumb? Do you realize that a cracker, a cookie, a crumb can't make other things leavened? So what's the focus need to be? I'm not saying you don't take the bread and the cookies and the yeast if that's, you know, use that to cook and the baking soda if you use it to cook or prepare food and remove that and get rid of that for the week. But prior to that night to be much observed, which is the beginning of the first holy day, it does not say, it says to what? Before the Passover, let a man, we're going to talk about this, examine his or herself, a person. It doesn't say you go like crazy and do your spring cleaning and get all these little crumbs out of your house. You don't have time to look in God's word and look, talk with God and say, where do I need to change and get rid of the spiritual, the analogy of the leaven of Tell me I'm wrong. This I just want more email from people. This is why I bring this up. I'm not trying to be nasty. It's just we have things that we've taught. You know, people have come to Passover the whole time they're asleep, and I ask them, you okay? You sick? No, I'm just exhausted, but I got all my deleavening done. The focus has been on the physical. Again, I didn't say you shouldn't deleaven. Vacuum your car. If you want to clean out the refrigerator, but don't turn your house upside down like I had to as a child, and many of you still do. I haven't lost my mind. I haven't become liberal. I look at what Scripture says. It doesn't say, find every crumb. Spiritually, it does. The crumbs of the heart and mind, that's not. So am I saying don't de leaven? If your options are you got a job that you're driving 1,600 miles a week, okay? You know, take your car to a place and have them vacuum it for you. I don't know. But if you're so tired, take the time to look at God's word or pray and say, where do I need to change and get rid of what I need to be a new creation and it's not godly and have Christ live in me before you get all fastidiously wound up about getting all that leaven out of your house. Does that make sense? I can already feel my email start pinging from this. That's fine. How much time are we preparing mentally, emotionally, and spiritually? Will this year be one of, if not the most profound and meaningful Passover? You see, self-examination should not just be once a year, but daily, weekly, monthly, yearly, and often. It's no secret. When do most Christians go to church in the world? Christmas and Easter. So if the only time you come to church is Passover and the Feast of Tabernacles, I would just ask you to say, well, maybe I should kind of maybe mix things up a little bit, change it, trying to be kind. It's not just once a year. That's one of the focuses of the yearly Passover and the annual Holy Days. 
I would like, if you would, with me today to go back to Paul's instructions on the Passover. Let's take a little closer look at what he wrote, and let's answer some very basic questions. Weekly, we have, I already mentioned it in the announcements, an interactive Bible discussion study called Bible Basics. Part of it, I was inspired. I was listening to a Waylon and Willie song. No. You know that song? Baby, it's time we got back to the base. Let's go to Lukenbach, Texas, Waylon and Willie and the boys. Um, so, the successful life we're living, I, here we go. Got us living like the Hatfields and McCoys. Hmm. I've been to Lukenbach, Texas. It's one of the most lame places I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> it's really small. It's, I, I think my garage is bigger than the whole place, but... But we chose Bible basics for a reason. And if you look at the description on the website why I chose it, which I encourage you to do, facilitate and use that site, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, if you would go with me. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Let's go to verse 23. For Paul says, I have received of the Lord that which I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. Symbolic also of one body, as you know. And when he had given thanks, that's why we pray over it during the service, he broke it, that's why we break it, up in pieces, so you can have a small piece. And he said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This you do as a memorial for me or in remembrance. After the same manner also, he took the cup. And when he had supped, okay, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. The King James says testament, covenant's better. This you do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. How often do we keep a birthday? How often do we celebrate if, or commemorate a death? Generally once a year. And I'm going to talk about it in detail, so I don't want to do that right now. But the instructions for Passover. There's nothing new here from what we also read in the gospel accounts. The unleavened bread and the wine, not grape juice, I might add, although I have conducted the Passover with grape juice. I did it in prison. Well, they weren't allowed to have alcohol. And I had a guy with a the safety off of like an M16, two of them. One of them pointed at me in a maximum security prison and said, what's in the cup? Didn't say much. I said, it's grape juice. Let me smell it. Okay, you're good. No alcohol, right? No, sir. Because they told me ahead of time. Don't do that. We can't, not allowed. So I did it with grape juice. Oh. <sighs> Man, one more strike and I'm going to the lake of fire feet up, right? So the symbols representing the broken body of our Savior, Jesus the Anointed One. As we listen to the bread being broken during the service, we should realize that the same thing happened to him physically. His body was beaten and broken to begin that payment for our sins. And the small glass of wine that we drink, it's a very small glass, should remind us, and by the way, if you're uh, an alcoholic, you may have been not had a drink in 50 years, but you're still considered an alcoholic, AA will teach you that. If you need non-alcoholic wine for that service or grape juice because you can't even have the non-alcoholic wine, it will do something with you, please let us know. 
Am I teaching that you can just go to grape juice, could taste better, and go ahead and use uh, Oreo cookies too? No. But as we drink that, it should remind us that finally his life's blood was poured out on the ground. He didn't drive a, die of a broken heart, as some people teach. As a final payment for our unfaithfulness to the laws of God and not yielding to him. So here's some basic questions to consider as we prepare. I said I was going to explain this. How often should we eat and partake of the Passover? In verse 26, going back to 1 Corinthians 11, that verse is used by many to say that we can take the symbols as many times as we wish. We can do them three times a week, once a week. Do I need to tell you which fellowships, which churches in the world take it more than once a year? I can. It's not a secret. Catholicism is one of the main ones. They do it frequently. <clears throat> I was at a wedding I think it was a wedding, wasn't it a Catholic wedding, where they did it at the end of the wedding. Before I, I, They did it somewhere in there, and they, the lady in front of me turned around and scowled at me because she said, are you going to go up? And I said, well, no. And she said, why not? I said, well, because they're dipping with the same spoon into the same thing from everybody. I said, no, that's not the reason. I said, I, I do this once a year, and this is not the Passover. Oh, one of those. Mm, mm, mm. Some do it weekly, some quarterly, but very few do it annually. The thought is, if we're able to do these things in remembrance of him, doesn't it show honor and dedication to our Savior if we take the symbols more often? Well, that sounds logical to me. Wouldn't he be pleased to see us being reminded of his incredible sacrifice every week? And doesn't this verse give us a liberty to do exactly that? The context, oops, there we go. Good biblical scholarship. In context, <clears throat> and that's always important for good Bible students, Paul's focus was that of correcting some of the problems in the Corinthian church that were detracting from the solemnity and the honor of the Passover. Read the context. He emphasized the elements of the Passover and the powerful significance of them. And he summed up that little section by reminding them that every time they observed this ceremony, they should be mindful of the fact that they were rehearsing the death of the Lord. But nowhere, let me repeat, nowhere did Paul tell them how often or when to take the symbols. That wasn't the thrust of his letter at this point. We have to go elsewhere to find that, which I'm going to do. The ordinance from the Old Testament tells us clearly there is how many Passovers a year. If my son, if my grandson's watching, number one, he knows number one. He's my number one grandson. So I go number one and he goes number one. He also points to the fish. You know, where's the fish? when he was barely a little over a year old. And, number one! He knows number one. Right? That'll come in handy with potty training later. But in Numbers chapter 9, if you missed that, good. I shouldn't have said that. Um, it talks about the second Passover, but there is one Passover a year. It is kept, and yes, we teach the whole Bible, the Old and the New Testament, not just the New Testament because the Old was done away. We don't teach that. God doesn't say that. That's a tradition. That's a teaching of men. So in Numbers chapter 9, it talks about if you miss the first Passover, there's availability for a second one. But it is the Passover is kept annually. And it has been from that time forward. Let's go to Luke chapter 2. Here's what we're going to read, Luke chapter 2 and verse 41, I think is what I want. Now his parents, this is Jesus Christ's parents, went to Jerusalem 
every year at the feast of the Passover. Did you read that? And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom, which would mean the custom is something they did every year. So we read it was kept once a year. Jesus and his family observed it as such. That might be a good idea for us to follow, don't you think? I mean, his ministry hadn't started yet, but he was still the Son of God. Well, maybe that wasn't convincing. So now let's go to chapter 22 of Luke. I think that's what I'm looking for. I'll find out shortly. Luke 22. Why am I saying that? I got up early enough that I'm kind of a little bit of a brain fog, but not too bad. No more than the normal old age syndrome. Luke 22, verse 14. All right. Jesus Christ, verse 13, they went and found as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. And when the hour was come, he sat down on the twelve apostles with them. And he said unto them, with desire, I've desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. So it was a very specific time. And from the beginning of the chapter, we can see it was still only what? Kept once a year. Christ didn't keep it multiple different times he didn't say after i die you can take it as many times as you want there are no scriptural examples of passover or communion if you like that word being taken by the church of god more than once a year i don't find it well you haven't read close enough Hmm. yeah i have i don't find it well If all the churches out there, most of them do it more than once, then it's got to be okay. I'm just sarcastic enough and paranoid enough that if everybody's doing it, and I want to find out why is everybody doing it. I learned that driving in California back in 1984 on the interstate there by the college. The traffic was doing like, I don't know what the speed limit was then, faster than it is now but the traffic was doing 15 miles an hour over and I was keeping up with them and I got pulled over no actually no that isn't what happened I wasn't keeping up with them I was doing the speed limit and people were passing me on both sides on the shoulder because I was like you know to keep from rear ending me and I got pulled over it wasn't California Highway Patrol in a motorcycle Ponch wasn't there Mm. But he pulled me over and he said, you know why I'm pulling you over? I said, I have no idea. He said, you're obstructing traffic. You're a hazard. I said, I'm doing the speed limit. He said, when everybody else is doing 15 or 20 over, stay with the flow of traffic. I said, but then I'm speeding. He said, I understand your point, but can you just drive faster? I'm giving you a warning. And I shook my head. I thought, man, this guy ought to run for president someday. Yeah. I'm a sarcastic lot today. I must have got an early waking. But So, just because everybody else does it, doesn't mean it's right. I live my life like that. The only type of car to drive is this, or truck is this. I may not like that, right? I don't care if everybody does it. You know, I have people say, oh, you got to go get a, was it a Tesla or a Telsa? I never can pronounce it right. What is it? Tesla. 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 The only test on that thing is law. But so, oh, man, if you're not, you're just not with it if you don't have an electric Tesla. I said, well, then I guess I'm not with it. And I don't plan on getting one. There are no instructions in the Bible to take the Passover more than once a year. So let's go to 1 Corinthians 11. Back there, and let's continue in verse 27. 
Following what he's talking about with this, Paul then continues on with a very strict warning for those who would take the Passover. Let's read it. Verse 27. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and this would be men or women, and let him or her eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are sick. Here's the Greek word, asenio, without strength and sickly, okay, not strong among you, and many have died. For if we would judge ourselves we would not be judged but when we are judged we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world we are told to examine ourselves and therefore to be ready to take the Passover in a worthy manner another question to consider is this have you and I been doing what Paul just wrote I believe part of the reason the church of God has so many sick people and people that are dying and dead is because we have neglected to discern the Lord's body. And I'm going to talk about that before we come up to next week. If we just continue along, perhaps as we are at this moment, would you and I be taking the Passover in an unworthy manner? Again, that's between you and God. So another basic question to consider as we prepare, what does it mean to be unworthy? I've had people say, oh, I'm not worthy. I'm worthless. There's a difference between worthless and unworthy. But what does it mean to be unworthy? Unworthily, in the King James Version, the Greek anaxios means ir ir irreverently, disrespectfully, in a so-so attitude, like, oh, whatever. Remember, the Corinthian brethren were entirely focused on themselves. We call in psychology self-absorbed. This world right now is full of self-absorbed people. On every, every, from every angle. But they were so self-absorbed to the point they were causing great problems in the Corinthian church. They were not focused on the sacrifice that had been made for them, and therefore they were not in a proper frame of mind to take the Passover. Obviously, we can't ever be worthy of taking the Passover. In fact, if it were possible for a human being to be worthy of so great a sacrifice... He or she wouldn't actually need the Passover. They wouldn't need it. It's because we are sinners and undeserving of the grace and goodness of God that we need the Passover and the sacrifice of our Savior. That being the case, there is a tremendous need for you and me to bear in mind the value of this awesome sacrifice that was made in our stead. Another question to consider. How are we to examine ourselves? In verse 28, Paul then, as we read, we'll read it again. But let a man, a person, examine him or herself, and so let him then eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Paul tells us the way to be certain we do not approach the Passover in an unworthy manner is what? is to make sure we have examined ourselves before we come. It's not just another worship service. It's not just a Sabbath or Holy Day service. It's the Passover. Before we come, and again, if you haven't done this yet, you've got eight days, I can... If you'd like to chat with me, I can give you some suggestions on how to examine yourself. The Greek word is dokimazo. It means to test, discern, and prove. 
What do you do before you get your driver's license? Nothing now, right? But what do you used to have to do? You used to have to take a test, a written and sometimes a driving test, if you can imagine that. I don't know if they still do that. Some places don't. I can tell by the way people drive. Or if they do, they forgot. Mm. Yeah. And and so why? Before you get, you know, before I received my degrees, I had to what? Take tests or Right, come up with a thesis and have it looked at and scrutinized and brought back and redone and then finally accepted. It's part of the testing process. You know what's interesting? There's a scripture, I'll let you look it up, that says what? Judgment is now upon the house of God. You're, being, you're, you're, you're in a testing time. How are we doing? Vine's commentary says this. It is to test with the expectation of approving or approval. So we are to examine ourselves. I'm not going to examine you, Nada, or Bruce, or Denny, or my wife. That's not my job. We're all really good at that, by the way. Do you know that? Noticing what and examining everybody else. We learned that when I was a real little kid. Yeah, 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 and you got three fingers pointing at yourself. So let's look at this, right? We need to be careful with that. But we discern the self. We test the self with the expectation of being ready to properly take the Passover. If the testing is to be done with the expectation of a final approval, then implied the process or if there are changes that we need to make or consider or go to God and say, I'm struggling with this, help me. It's a process. It isn't just, I give my heart to the Lord. Lord, not Lord. I've heard him say, I give my heart to the Lord. Give my heart to the Lord. No. I'm going to read from a book uh, that I, one of my favorite books, Words to Live By. If you can find this, latch on to it. They're really hard to come by. Um, Simon & Schuster, this one, first copyright, 1947. Uh, It's a treasure of words to live by, selected, interpreted by 90 eminent men and women by William Nichols, edited. Um, Anyway. So on page 31, King Vidor, or Vidor, who was a producer and director, this is called The Looking Glass. William Makepeace Thackeray said, The world is a looking glass and gives back to every man the reflection of his own face. He said, I had to live a long time before I found the courage to admit to myself that we, All of us make our own world. The realization came to me in a very simple way. Though I am a Californian, no hisses and boos here, because I know we might have somebody on from California in the morning. Though I am a Californian, I make frequent trips to New York. And I I had decided that all New York cab drivers were impatient, ill-tempered, or hated their jobs. And hotel employees and railroad personnel were the same. I found them all difficult to get along with constantly. I'm going to be very careful here, but I can't disagree with this statement, that statement. Then one day in New York, I came upon the words from Thackeray quoted above. The world is a looking glass and gives back to every man the reflection of his own face. Very same day, when a cabbie and I were snarling at each other, this thought occurred to me. Could this whole situation be the result of my own thinking and my outlook? I began to live Thackeray's idea, and soon it became a part of me. The result, on my next trip to to the Northeast, I encountered not one unpleasant, unpleasant taxi driver, elevator operator, or employee. Had New York changed, or had I? The answer was clear. 
To abandon excuses for one's shortcoming is like journeying to a distant land where everything is new and strange. Here you can't continue to blame someone or something else for failures or difficulties. You have to assume the responsibility of them yourself. Of course, outside pressures do influence our lives, but they don't control them. To assume they do is sheer invasion. It's so easy to say, not my fault. And I tell the story, before I finish this, of landing a very, very difficult, turbulent, stressful landing coming into Houston from an international flight. And when we finally, I mean, with luggage, and it was just, it was bad. People were screaming. It was wind shear going on. We almost got hit by another plane that was taking off. We saw that out the window because we were at this angle. And we finally hit it and boom, bang, boom, and the plane finally stopped. And there was a huge cheer through most of the plane. This is not a joke. This really happened. So the captain or the co-captain or pilot, I don't know who it was, came on and said, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for hanging in there. I'm so sorry this was such a difficult landing, a number of things. I've never had this happen before. And then he added a little bit of levity, which some of you will not appreciate. But he said, I want you to know, it's not the plane's fault. It wasn't the pilot or the co-pilot's fault. It wasn't the stewardess's fault. It was the ass fault. And only half the people laughed, because most of them were like, it all makes sense. And sure enough, when... I looked later when we were on the jet bridge in there. I looked. I could see where we had landed. There was a chunk of the free of the freeway. Yeah, the whatever they call the runway. Thank you. I knew it had a way. Just not the wrong way. It was the right way, but the runway. But that was kind of bumpy or buckled. They were going to fix, and they hadn't fixed it just right. So he was partly true. But anyway. It's not my fault. And that's what this whole world screams. It's not our fault. It's not my fault. Nobody wants to say, I messed up. I broke the law. I sinned. You know what the hardest thing to say if you're married? You're right. I'm a buffoon. I'm wrong. I sinned. I'm a bad person. Please forgive me. Why? I ain't going to do that. That's why people get divorced. Think I'm going to admit to anything? Now, unless you're schizophrenic or delusionary or all kinds of other things, you generally don't have an argument or a fight with yourself. Right? Unless it's going after the chips and you know you don't need those late at night. No, yes, no, yes. You know, you stand in the mirror yelling at yourself. I've seen people do that. I've counseled people that have done that, but that's not normal. Normally, you have to have someone else to fight with, to argue with, to pick a bone with. Right? So if there was only one human being on the earth, would there be any fighting? Well, Paul said, from whence, and James said, from whence come wars and fightings among you. So I guess we'd fight with ourselves. He said, since that day in New York, I've come to believe that this idea is the basis of all human relationships. It doesn't matter whether it's your neighbors, your mother-in-law. Mother-in-laws get a bad rap. I have a lovely one. Uh, I don't like the mother-in-law jokes, so don't ever tell those around me. Or we'll fight. Or the people of a foreign nation. I can tell you traveling internationally significantly and pastoring internationally, you can complain all you want. But you need to adapt to that culture and stop bringing your culture there. That's why we're in all these problems in the world. If the leaders of this country could get it, do what you want to do here, whatever that is, but don't take it to other countries and try to fix them because they're going to try to fix you. The quickest way to become the other, to correct the other fellow's attitude is to correct your own. Try it. 
He says it works, and it adds immeasurably to the fun of meeting people and being alive. What we must compare ourselves to, obviously, is this, the Word of God. We hold up the mirror of the Bible, and we see what our reflection really looks like. I shave a couple times a week under my beard here. See how neat that is? Kind of rough today. It's like a day's growth. But try shaving without a mirror. Okay? Try making your hat look nice on just right without a mirror. I mean, you probably can, knowing not as you can. But Right? If we continue to do this over the next few days, I'd like to share a couple thoughts by way of perspective. May we consider before we partake of the Passover this year in 2024, you and I have to know God's purpose and what he expects from us. The purpose and expected end result of our calling must be the heart of our examination process. Let's go to Romans 8. Romans 8, verse 15. For you have not... For you have not... Received a spirit of bondage again to fear, but have received a spirit of sonship. I think the King James says adoption. The spirit of sonship whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are, here's our identity, we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and join heirs with Christ, if that so be, that we suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified together. So first and foremost, we are called to be the children of God. It's not just some random exercise or some sort of cute hobby for God. Well, I think we'll do that. Or simply the elements he's experimenting with. It's much more intimate and intense because God is creating a family and we are in every sense of the word his children. He also calls us his friends. What did Christ call the disciples? He said, I no longer call you my students. I call you my friends. I had someone tell me, oh, you can't say our Lord and Master, our King and our brother and our friend. I sure can. I sure can. First Timothy chapter 2. Let's go over there in verse 4. And more than just a child of God, what does he say? 1 Timothy 2, verse 4. Who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. So God desires that relationship as a child of God, not just with those he's called, but eventually all that he calls, all of mankind if possible. And the only way, right, he doesn't want anyone lost in that process, by the way. The only way that could happen is if an individual absolutely refuses to be part of God's family by refusing to submit and obey his creator and simply say, "Ah, I give up, I quit. Some of us, I know I'm going to probably offend some, some of us as we age, need to look at the end game of why God called us and quit our whining and complaining. Because you know what? As we get older, you're going to hurt more. You're going to suffer. Life's going to inhale much wind. Do I need to explain what that word means? God says what? Look what I have called you to. Here's where you need to stay focused on. Quit whining about you don't like your house, you don't like your food, you don't like your body, you don't like your mate, you don't like your lack of a mate, you don't like this, you don't like that, you don't like your church, you don't like your country, you don't like the leader, you don't like the people running for government. We fill it in. 
then what should we be doing? Part of the examination process is say, I'm a child of God. God has promised I'm going to be part of his family. Oh, I don't know if I can make it. I don't know if I can even keep the Passover. That's not from God. That's you thinking. God doesn't think that way. What's he say in Romans 8, 28 and 31, 32? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. No, that's Philippians 4. He says, all things work to good for them that are called by God according to his purpose and love him. And then in verse 31, he said, if God be with us, who can be against us? So what are you fussing about? Oh, I don't sleep well anymore. My plumbing doesn't work. My vision is gone. Lost my job. Don't have any money. Fighting with my wife. Kids don't like me. Neighbors stink. Hate the guy running for president. All of them. Boy, let me get your address and send you a block of cheese to go with your wine. Now, that being the case, another point. Realize to what lengths God is willing to go to accomplish what he's doing. How far is God willing to go to make sure his goal is accomplished with you and me? Let's go to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. This sums it all up. Verse 13 to 17. And by the way, this is going to be an interesting scripture because there are many that haven't read this before. Because many still believe you go to heaven when you die, and you don't. And your wife's not in heaven looking at you, okay? Those of you that have lost mates, no man has ascended to heaven, but he that came down from heaven. Who would that be? The word that became flesh, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. Acts 2.34 validates that as well. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that was begotten, that whosoever believes on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And believing on him doesn't just say, oh, I believe on you, Jesus. Believing means what? Keep his commandments and do what he said to do in the Old and the New Testament, folks. For God sent not his Son in the world to judge and condemn it, but that the world through him might be saved. God the Father and Jesus Christ were willing to take an incredible risk. One of the only two God beings in existence had to come to earth as a human being. The Trinity is not a God being, a person. There is not a triune God. There's God the Father and Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is the power by which Jesus Christ and God live. He had to live. Christ had to live an absolutely sinless life. The risk was that if he sinned, that's the biggest word in the English language, if, even just once, just one little tiny sin, the plan was a complete... <laughs> bust. You ever blow up a balloon? Finally it goes ah, ruined it. If he sinned, then his death would be justified. He could only pay for his own transgression. But if he carried it off perfectly, then his unjustified death would be great enough to cover all the sins of mankind since Adam and forward. Romans 5. Let's go back there. Romans 5 verse 6. The logical one to fulfill this role was what? The Son, or the Word. Romans chapter 5, verse 6 through 11. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commanded his love toward us, commended rather, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we be saved now, we shall be saved with wrath from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, 
we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. The logical one to fulfill the role was the Son or the Word. He would completely submit to the will of the Father and give himself willingly, while at the same time the Father willingly gave the life of his own Son for us. So they both sacrificed and gave. What more could God possibly give? What he's saying by this is he will willing our Father and Jesus Christ to go all out and not withhold anything. That's incredibly encouraging to me and to you, folks. Is it not? One more thing to consider here. Therefore, as we come up to the Passover, we cannot and we must not withhold anything but take everything in our lives and examine them and say to Father, please show me things that I may not even see that need to be changed and repented of. God expects that attitude in return. James chapter 1, we covered this uh, not long ago. In the book of James, chapter 1, verse 21 to 25. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if by any hearer of the word and not a doer, he is likened to a man beholding his natural face in the glass. He beholds himself, goes his way, and straightway forgets what manner of man he was. But whosoever looks into the perfect law of liberty, God's word, and continues therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, I call that a sermon taster. Oh, that was a good message. An hour and a half later, so what I talk about? I don't know. But a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So we need to consider, what is our relationship with God like at the present? Question to ask. Do you pray? Do you do personal Bible study? Or do you have an excuse for why you don't? Because we all have an excuse. Meditation, reflection, pondering, considering our lives. Fasting on occasion, thankfully we only got to do it once a year in atonement. Whew. We're always going to need work. We're human. I'm not talking about the amount of time that you spend on prayer and Bible study and the things you do. I'm not going to teach that. Many have thundered that at us. Some litmus test. Well, how long did you pray today, Bruce? If you're nice, you'll say, nanya. You know what that means? Nanya business? He won't say that. He probably has a few more words to say than that if I ask him that. But how long? That's simply wrong. Ministers are not there to be servants. They're not God. They don't have the authority to ask people those questions. The church is here to serve God's children, not control them. Why, if you're not getting up at four and praying for an hour and a half and studying for an hour before you go to work and drive however many miles, you just don't get it. I've heard some whoppers, let me tell you. Why, I get up every day, three times a day, I don't take a lunch. I use that time to fast and go pray and study the Word of God. Great. <laughs> Hallelujah to you, buddy. Keep a spot for me underneath you somewhere when you're in the kingdom, will you? What's our relationship like? What is your relationship? Now we're going to get real personal. What's your relationship with others in the body like? Or other people? Where you work? Your neighbors? What's it like? The more and more than look, once you see the problem the facets of our own character, then we have to, with God working in us, I hate to say this word because no one likes it, 
change them. The word no one really likes, repent. You know what that means? To change. As we covered in the Bible basics. Epistrapo in the Greek means to do this. I'm changing direction. Now I'm going. Bruce, you're the mathematician, 180 degrees. Because this would be 360, so I didn't really change much. I just looked away for a minute and I was looking. Okay, now I can go right back to how I was. I'm getting dizzy. <laughs> Let's go to Romans 12. Romans 12. We're getting near the end, folks. Those of you watching the time. I haven't put Denny to sleep yet, so mission accomplished. Romans 12, verses 1 to 4. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable in the perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. But to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man that measures of faith. I was listening to an interview uh, briefly between Mike Tyson. He's going to fight some Paul guy. Jake Paul, I think. Maybe well, I don't know who it is. I don't know. the. But you know how Mike Tyson is. He, he said, uh, dude, the dude just needs to know his place. I may be 50-some years old, and he's half my age. But, you know, he says... Uh, Basically, this ain't my first rodeo. He needs to know his place. He's spouting off about Mike Tyson soft and going to get his rear end whooped and all this. And Mike Tyson, just matter of fact, and I don't know, you know, that's a large difference. But he said you need to know your place. And so we should not think more highly than we ought to, but think soberly according to God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Verse 4, for as we, many members in one body and all members do not have the same function. I remember Dennis Luker, deceased now. He said there's been way too much focus in the church on office. We need to look at the function of service, what our God has called us to do. That's still haywire and upside down, and it will be till Christ returns because there's too many, too many human beings. Do we live it? We can make sacrifices in full confidence that we know it's worth it. Our Father has given everything for us, and we can well afford to do the same, giving of our entire beings like our older brother, Jesus Christ. Let's look at a few more scriptures. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4, a couple more rather. Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4, verse 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you henceforth not walk as other Gentiles walk. Don't do as all the other nations do in the vanity of their mind. Having the understanding darkened, alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work out all uncleanness and greediness. You know, the word lasciviousness here can also mean liberalism or law-breaking. Do we see that going on today? But you have not so learned from Christ. If so be that you have heard of Him and have been taught by Him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conducts of the old man, which is corrupt, it's hypocritical, it's exaggerated according to deceitful lusts and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. That changed and converted person, a new creature. Yep, pretty simple. For, for us humans, pretty hard. So we have a few short days to finish our physical, mental, emotional, spiritual preparation for this Passover for years, this year, 2024. How prepared 
will you be and I be this year? How memorable and deeply meaningful will the Passover season going to be for you and me personally? Let's look at one more scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, in this light. 1 Corinthians 5, and verse 6. Your glory is not good. Don't you know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? That word, some translations, a little yeast leavens the whole lump. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven. That's talking about the spiritual leaven. That you may be a new lump. Is that you are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. And then in verse 8. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Friends, let us examine ourselves and be prepared. Take the Passover this year in a manner worthy of the universal consequence of the sacrifice of our Messiah. Keep this upcoming feast in sincerity and truth. And may this year's Passover be for you a most profound and meaningful one for each one of us. Let us consider as we prepare. You join me in prayer. <coughs> our Father, we come before you and we do address you as our Father. We're told to pray to you. We come before you and we thank you for the sacrifice of Christ and thank you for both of you willing to do what you did for all of us. We're your children. That's an incredible blessing. We thank you for that. Humans, Father, you love human beings. You don't, like the, you don't love the sin, but you do love the sinner. We pray as we come up to the Passover, you would help us to dig deep, to study to examine our hearts and minds, examine our relationship, discerning the Lord's body with you and what Jesus Christ went through with him and then with each other. And that goes without saying we have failed miserably in those relationships. The body of Christ is not discerning itself. And because of that, many are sick and many sleep or have died. Can we reverse that process? I believe we can. But it's never easy. And it's only made possible and done by the indwelling of your spirit and becoming deeply converted, which means to change. So, Father, we thank you now. We love you. We pray you'll bless the meal we're about to partake of. Thank you for protecting us. Please continue to do that. Go with us in this next week. Be with us. Help us not to get discouraged by things we go through and keep our adversary and his minions from us according to your will. And we just thank you and love you and praise you and ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.